to Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice, Worldwide Press Conference. We have a slate of stars and filmmakers with us. Let's introduce them. First is producer, Deborah Snyder. Second is star, Holly Hunter. Third, star, Jesse Eisenberg. Gal Gadot. Star, Ben Affleck. Director Zack Snyder. <laughs> Henry Cavill. In third. Good morning, everyone. A bit more enthusiasm. Yeah, yeah. Amy Adams. I know it's early. Lawrence Fishburne. Oh. Diane Lane. Woo. And producer Charles Rowe. Right. Thank you. Let's welcome them all. Oh, I have a microphone. Great. Mm. Greetings. How are you? That is a Charles. Zach, we're going to start up here, and then we're going to open it up to the, qu to the press. You are known as a director who is unafraid of big projects. I remember they said Watchmen was a film that couldn't be made. Was this at all intimidating? What drew you into this? Weirdly, um, I think that if we had uh, not evolved the project the way we did, it would have been a little bit more intimidating. If, for instance, someone had just come up to me and said, hey, do you want to do a movie where Batman fights Superman? I would have been like, yo, okay. <laughs> He's back a little bit. Um, but because it kind of, you know, oh, it kind of evolved over time, by the time we were shooting, I think it was the first time I realized 100%. Like, I think at the camera test when I was actually looking at Batman and <laughs> Superman in their costumes that I realized, like, we're going to, that's going to happen, huh? So, um, yeah, but, it, but amazing and fun and an honor to, you know, deal with these icons. So it's, it's great. Start with questions. Can I have some? Uh, yes. Morning. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, losing my voice here. Bruce Kirkland, Toronto Sun, Sun Media in Canada. Uh, so this is a question leading out of uh, where Zach uh, was just touching upon for both Henry and Ben in regards to having these iconic superheroes. And you've been down this path, in obviously, in Man of Steel, Henry, and Ben, it's new for you, but um, bringing them into the same world and having an emotional base as well as all of the action in the film, I'm curious what went into working out your own identities and then um, pitting them against each other. Hmm. I'll start? <laughs> yeah, I'll start. <laughs> An easy one to start. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> what went into it, I, again, as I always say, it's going to the source material. There's an awful lot of psychology in Superman because it's the one way you can find to crack the shell. And when it comes to playing the character, especially in this movie where we still see the growth of Superman before seeing the finished product of what we know and love from the character in the comic books, it's... It was just delving into the psychology and the weaknesses therein and playing with the relationship of between him and Lois and him and Martha and then, of course, the conflict he has when facing the likes of Batman. Yeah, for me, there was really enough material in the screenplay that, that Chris Terrio wrote and with Zach's direction, there was, a, you know plenty for me to grab onto and to help, you know, use my imagination to try to build this character. As you were, uh, Scott was just saying, it's certainly daunting um, because of the people who have, like, played this character before and the great filmmakers, you know, most recently, obviously, Christian and Chris did three brilliant movies and all the guys who, who went before them, there, there's that element of sort of um, healthy respect you have for the project and for the characters and their history. Uh, and you know, it raises the bar certainly. And I felt that uh, I was in really good hands with with this script and and with Zach. And so that uh, that was where I focused my attention. Hi guys, to your left uh, over here, I'm David from Israel. Um, I wonder if you can comment about working with our national pride and joy sitting to your left, Mr. Affleck, Mr. Rick Cavill. I was a Go tremendous uh, treat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She's the best. Um, <laughs> No, really, so far, so good. but Gal did such a great, amazing job and made all the scenes uh, that I was in with her better, made me better. And she's I, she's my favorite part of the movie when she shows up and I don't give anything away, but uh, she helps me lots out. Of money to say that. 
and uh, she's a terrific actress, and I think Wonder Woman is going to be very good. And uh, I, I just, it's a lot of fun. I'm excited to keep working with her. It's tough to sound genuine by just repeating that, but uh, it's true. Uh, Gal, ditto is a cool answer. Yeah, ditto. <laughs> Gal cuts a fine figure as Wonder Woman. She mm. brings something particular, something statuesque, something, something otherworldly to the character, and it's remarkable to see. You're welcome. <laughs> I am Jeffrey Taylor with uh, Movies.com and Fandango. I've got a question that actually applies to uh, se several of you. Uh, the The question is this: There, I'm I'm a fan, a big fan, and I deal with a lot of fans who can be sometimes irrational, and sometimes when somebody gets cast. Wait, what? Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> sometimes fans can be a little bit irrational oh. when when a casting announcement is made and it's not uh, what they expected, and I'm wondering how you might deal with that when you do hear something like that from fans, either on social media or, or any other place. And I, I guess this would, would apply to um, uh, Jesse, Gal, <laughs> Ben, um, in, in some ways Amy, and in some ways Lawrence from, from, the, from I what I've read. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Everybody Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, this is super fan. <laughs> Yeah, I cast Henry first, so then they were like, and then after that, they're like, what does he do? He's lost his mind. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly strange and, and, and unnerving to be criticized for a part you haven't yet been able to screw up. But, um, <laughs> uh, um, but uh, you know, I think, I think I probably also would have been surprised had I you know, read that I was playing Lex Luthor without having had access to this wonderful script and this incredible character written by uh, Chris Terrio, who created a character that uh, I thought was suitable for me. Um, you know, if you look at just the canon and the mythology of, of, uh, and, the, and the history of Superman, I might not be the first person to come to mind, but if you read the script and understood how the character was contextualized in this kind of like modern era and the way he was written, um, I knew that I could do it well, and I knew that, you know, or at least I hoped that after people had seen the movie, they would understand that I was more appropriate than they had originally feared. I wish I had heard you say that two days ago. I could have just Xeroxed <laughs> exactly. it for all my <laughs> answers. So very well said. Yeah. yeah, I agree with them as well. Um, also, I, 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 you know, you can't please them all. And for me, being an actress, my responsibility is not to pay too much attention to all the noise around me, but to pay attention to the script, to the director, that I'm Zach, um, so and, 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 be, and, and protect the character and try to tell her story the best I can. And I can only do my best. I am Jill to the West Australia, and I have a question. So how you got into this? That's okay. a long um, story. Did you work out with the boys? <laughs> what what was the last one? Did I? Did you work out work with the out. boys? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it all began um, when Warner Brothers won wanted to audition me to something. They would not say what. Uh, so of course I was intrigued <laughs> yeah. and I did the audition and Zach was there and it was great and two weeks later they asked me to do a camera test with Ben. I said great, what am I being, t what, 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 what's the role, what's the part? <laughs> they said well my agent told me honestly they would not say a word but expect a phone call from Zach. Zach called me the same night and he was saying well I'm not sure if you have it in Israel uh, but did you ever hear about Wonder Woman? My, I literally, I think I went dead for like a few good seconds, came back to life, and then I tried to pull off my best voice saying, Wonder Woman, <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, <laughs> of course, Wonder Woman. And then I did the camera test with Ben, which was great, and, and Ben is fantastic. And uh, seven weeks later, it was a torture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I literally went through seven stages of grief. The first two, two weeks, I felt good about that. I had a good feeling. And then from then on, I started to be angry and to be <laughs> like, I, it was bad. But finally, seven weeks later, they called to say that I got the part. And that's, that, that was it. Here we are. Thank you.
I knew right away, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> you could have said something, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, um, it's Lindsay true. Barr, AP. Uh, this is for uh, Zack Snyder and, and Deborah. Um, how, uh, how critical is this movie? Or can you just talk about the importance of this movie to launching this, this sort of expanded universe and expanded franchise um, of DC movies? Again, I think the thing that's interesting about the process with this movie and sort of the way it's evolved is that, you know, the idea of having Batman fight Superman is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so that's why we made a movie. Um, is not only ridiculous, but also once we had committed to that ridiculous idea, we were, it was then only that we were like, okay, so that implies that a universe exists where Batman and Superman exist together which was a weird i know it seems like obvious in weird in comic book in the comic book world but had not existed really in the in the movies so though it seems like an obvious notion if you're you know just sort of casually like oh well batman and superman of course they they they're both comic book heroes so uh, yeah they're like down the street from each other right yeah. like they bump into each other <laughs> all the time uh that's maybe why they're mad but they uh but so once that sort of idea had taken root and existed as reality. It was then only that we were like, well, I was really obsessed with, I am and have been obsessed with the Trinity and really wanted to see the Trinity, that being Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman in a single moment. And that was a thing that I was really interested in, in trying to get into this movie. Not that I didn't have enough to deal with already, but I thought that would be a cool thing to see. And those conversations are really what led to this dawn of justice kind of subheading for the film. Um, and that we could now begin to talk about or have conversations about the fact that the Justice League and or the DC Universe now could evolve from this. And we had, you know, I feel like frankly we had just, you know, it's a difficult, it's a difficult notion um, especially at a studio like this that's really filmmaker driven and sort of project to project. You know, it's a very, it's a difficult notion to say, oh, okay, well, you're making a movie, but it's actually connected to that guy's movie and connected to that guy's movie, and they're all going to be, it's all going to be a great, big, fun sandbox, and we're all going to play nice in it, um, which is a great thing, but it's a difficult thing to just make appear. And I think that's the great, that's what the luck and sort of serendipitous nature of this movie that's allowed the world's now to kind of coalesce. And I don't think it was a, it became a plan and it's becoming a thing, but it was only in those kind of, in its infancy that we realized, yeah, oh my gosh, this can, this can be a thing. Yeah, and at the same time, I think we wanted to set up and introduce these characters, but we also had a really rich story to tell. So it was a careful balance about telling the story, the Batman and Superman story, and giving a little hint and a tease to the story of Justice League that's yet to come. Do we have a question on the left here? A uh, question for Charles. I'm right down here. Um, can you talk a little about being the overseer of the bringing the DC universe to the screen, how hands-on you have to be? Does it make you the Warner Brothers version of Kevin Feige, for example? Well, I think... It's, you know, it's a team of us. Um, the the team is obviously uh, Debbie, Zach, myself. Uh, Jeff Johns is part of it. it. The interesting and fun, it's a very interesting challenge, and uh, but it's also a lot of fun because uh, even when we were making films that might have sequel possibilities, uh, we never really in the past, even like with The Dark Knight, never really thought about what exactly is the next movie going to be. Uh, in fact, you know, when, when we went from Batman Begins to The Dark Knight, we didn't even, because we ended the Batman Begins with The Joker, we thought, okay, we'll probably should do The Joker on the next one, but we never really had a story or anything. <laughs> here, <laughs> here uh, we're, cool. we're constantly thinking in the future, not only how to make each individual film stand on its own, be compelling, be fun, be thought-provoking, have great characters. But we're also thinking way down the road about how these things are going to interconnect uh, and make sense and also leave room for 
other great filmmakers to be involved and to make sure that while we want to get to a certain place, we don't stay too rigid and too fixed on exactly the methodology of how we get there. We have to leave room for the creative process to allow it to evolve. And um, it's just really uh, exciting and challenging uh, every single day. Oh, he's hands on. <laughs> We're shooting one woman now. He's hands on, definitely. I, I think wherever you are in the world, because we're making a number of these in different phases, uh, we always have to be, thank God all I can say for high technology, because you really have to be, you have to stay connected. So if, if, uh, if Debbie's in Los Angeles and I'm in London, or Zach's commuting back and forth, or if we're making a film in Toronto, uh, you just have to stay in touch with it through every form of, uh, of, of medium that you can. and. Uh, Every day is long because somewhere, uh, you know, somewhere on some continent, <laughs> there's uh, a portion of one of the movies that you're working on. Ga uh, uh, Rav uh, Shechnik from Yediot Achonot Israel. <laughs> Let me speak. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming we exist in the fictitious reality we've set up in Batman v Superman um, when you ask me what Clark Kent would ask myself and or Ben, and I believe Clark would ask something along the lines of what do you think the value of Batman is and what do you think the value of the Superman is? I, ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Clark is very yeah, I didn't smart. even think I had to answer my own <laughs> excellent question. <laughs> In the fictitious reality, it's explained very clearly in the movie, and I agree with it. Nice. Raz from uh, Israel, Yadio Dachonot. Gal, it's a question for Gal. Uh, you, became, uh, you, you made this story, you became the first Wonder Woman in the movies. Uh, do you often think for yourself, like me, Gal Gadot, from uh, small Roshine from Israel, made it big? And uh, how was your uh, last week, your crazy week? <laughs> um, it's a huge honor to be the one who got this amazing opportunity to tell such an important story. And <clears throat> I'm sorry, this last week I've been taking many interviews and I'm, I'm starting to lose my voice. Um, <clears throat> sorry. So it's been a great honor to be the one who's going to tell this amazing story. I feel very, very grateful. No, never in my life. Um, I never imagined, I, I never planned on being an actress. I never planned on being Wonder Woman. Everything happened and I'm grateful and happy and I'm, and I'm in love with, with what I do. Um, um, what was the next question, the other one? The last one. My last week, or okay. You want me to tell about Roshain? <laughs> Roshain is a very small city close to Tel Aviv. Uh, the last week was very, very intensive. I was very, very excited about it. Um, I had many um, talk shows. I reunite with the people that I love. That I'm work. I've been working on this magnificent movie. I hope you all enjoyed it. By the way, you better. <laughs> we worked hard, um, and, and it's great, and I'm happy to be here, and it's happening, and I'm kind of still in denial. I, I'm, I'm so busy working that I have absolutely no time to sit down and, and relax and enjoy the ride. I'm enjoying everything, but I think that it'll take me some time until I really understand what's going on. Ali, you've been quiet over there. What's it like to have a character written into the DC universe? That character was specifically written for you. Oh, well, um, I guess that's kind of uh, liberating, um, and, and, you know, in, in comparison with everybody else on, the, on this uh -huh. panel. Um, uh, but it was, it was lovely to kind of uh, have a character who was in the midst of this mayhem of the story and kind of bring uh, uh, some sense and sensibility to the to the proceedings and uh be dealing with a character as as combustible as lex and especially as as jesse's lex is as 
as volatile and complicated and emotional as he is, it was really um, a fun ride uh, to take with him and kind of negotiate the waters of staying incredibly open and curious to what his point of view was and then as knowledge accumulates to arrive at, at, a, at a, a decision that, that I felt was um, rational and reasonable. Lawrence and Diane, you are a veteran of the superhero genre. Was this a different experience? What's it like to enter a world that big where you're combining that many heroes? Well, you just don't think the stakes can get higher, <laughs> and then suddenly you find out they can. I mean, it's, it's definitely thrilling to witness the film and the final product and see my thread in the tapestry and how it reverberates throughout the story. Also, selfishly, it was very lovely to, on both films, be uh, the commencement of this huge production. You know, Martha provides a gentle uh, beginning, I would think, uh, comparative to where we're headed. So it's nice to break in the crew and have the first day of school all together. <laughs> yeah. And Lawrence, what's it like to be an editor? Do you get to take on the press, take us down? Oh, I, I don't know anything about that. I just learn my <laughs> lines and set them. I just, you know, as I, I'm really more of a fan. You know, I'm a, I'm a comic book reader and a, a collector and have been since I was a kid. And really for me, this movie is, it's a movie I've been waiting to see for 35 years. I can't even believe I'm in the movie, uh -huh. you know? I believe we have a question. Hi, my name is Jamie Brodnax. My outlet is Black Girl Nerds. Um, my readers are very excited that I'm here because I have a website that's about empowering women and women of color. So yes, this question is for Gal. They're like, interview <laughs> Wonder Woman. So um, I wanted to ask you, Gal, first of all, um, did you watch any of the Linda Carter series, uh, Wonder Woman, growing up when you were researching this role? And also, um, what advice do you have for women out there who are actresses that are interested in doing films that are about comic book superheroines? Interesting. Um, <clears throat> the first question was, I'm sorry, I'm so jet lagged. The the right? No, I'm I was too to young to watch voice. the Linda Carter TV show. I was minus five. But after they <laughs> cast me for this role, uh, I did watch a couple of, um, of uh, episodes. I think that Linda Carter was a magnificent Wonder Woman and it's certainly big shoes to, to fit into. Uh, but when they cast me for this movie, Zach and everyone had a very clear vision on who Wonder Woman should be and, 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 and what's her story and how they want to tell it. And all I had to do is really give my own notes and inputs and just embody everything and, and be her. And um, I truly think, you know, I'm, I, I have a four-year-old daughter and she adores princesses. At the same time, she would tell me, the princess, she's so weak, she falls asleep, the prince will come and save her and kiss her and he's the hero. So I'm so happy that I'm so happy to be the one who's who's gonna tell the Wonder Woman story. It's such a very it's such an important story to be told, to tell, and 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 I'm grateful for it. But I also think that it's so important for girls and boys to have a female strong superhero to look up to. And the more the merrier and, and there's plenty of room to many more women to come. And um, I'm very, very happy to be, to be a part of that. I, lo I love that you just said girls and boys. I love that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I believe we have a question in the first round. Uh, um, hi, Magali from France. Uh, it's a question for Zach. Um, it's kind of a big uh, thing in the movie when Clark and Bruce realize they ha their mother share the same name. Um, do you think this is something that's going to be appealing to the fans? Uh, in the set, well, it's, I mean, it's from the comic books, right, so. But it's a very important thing yeah, for it is them important. bonding around I that. I mean, yeah, I, I, I feel like, um, you know, when we, when we were talking about that whole 
aspect of the movie and just what is the thing that humanizes um, Superman for for Batman. It seemed really interesting to us to kind of think about it in those terms, you know, in that, you know, he's basically now looking at someone with a mother, you know, and that's different. You know, it, he becomes different in that moment, you know, and um, to, 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 to Batman, you know, the, the idea that this, what he would consider an alien, what he would consider sort of this otherworldly creature that could care less about humanity, <coughs> that he could bring himself to a certain emotional place with that would be normally difficult for Batman even to get to, that he had gotten and whipped himself in, into a, enough of a, a fervor that he could, he, he had achieved a thing that maybe was even particularly difficult for him. But then to sort of now see that guy, you know, look in a mirror, that was, that was the idea. And fans, I don't know how they'll feel about it. <laughs> I'll tell you how fans will feel about it. <laughs> I forgot that they had the same, that their mothers had the same name. But it's my favorite moment in the movie as a fan when Batman meets Martha Kent. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, hi. Sure. Can I also add one little tidbit of, of joy? Did I get this wrong, but isn't, wasn't my scene the first time we got to experience Ben in his regalia. As yeah, it was. Batman. It was. That was the very first. That was the very first, first, that that was the debut first moment. moment. Yeah, that was the first, first day. Right. And it Although I discovered Diane in an earlier movie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Where Superman's mom and I had a different kind of relationship. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ben. <laughs> no offense, Henry. <laughs> Stop reminding me. It's a very, it's a very complex fabric. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, hi. Uh, we're from Japan, and uh, first, uh, uh, we'd like to ask you know, uh, first, Zach, to Zach, um, uh, why did you cast Tao, uh, you know, in this film? I'm uh, the Japanese ac actress, Tao, oh, Tao, yeah. uh, Tao in the yeah. movie. And also, you know, for uh, Ben and uh, Henley and uh, Jesse, uh, how was it working with uh, Tao? Can you? Yeah. The reason I cast Tao was because first, um, we were looking for, we had this character um, in the script and really, um, I, honestly, I, I had seen um, Wolverine and thought that she was amazing in the movie and was like, well, who is that? Um, and uh, we, sh she came in and I met with her and um, she did an audition that was amazing and I just was like, we, we, need, to, we need to get this woman in the movie if it's possible um and i think since then it's been she was an amazing uh honor and joy to work with on set and just cool and yeah she's great yeah i thought she was great and fun and very uh smart and great actress we had a good time i i really didn't get much of a chance to in interact we had a uh, one scene which we were in the same room for because when we shot that scene I, I had no interaction with her in the for the Lex Luthor party the charity gig but uh, in Congress I, I saw her across the room and she looked marvelous from across <laughs> the room <laughs> oh yeah um, I, I loved working with her um, I think we probably make a maybe possibly unintentionally comedic pair um, <laughs> she plays my assistant, although from like an aesthetic perspective, we should probably switch places. And, uh, <laughs> and she has a really unusual and great sense of humor, which you wouldn't expect because you, didn't, you wouldn't think that she would need to. <laughs> Amy, are you beginning to feel like a Superman veteran? Does this get easier? Do you get used to it? Is there a certain language you need to adopt when you're playing a, a superhero character or the love interest of a superhero character? Um. I mean, no. I mean, I, you never really get used to it. The scale of it's always really impressive, and every time I walk on set, I'm completely blown away. And um, what has been so nice is getting to know everybody over the course of years and getting to bring these relationships we've all, you know, um, established over the course of working together and then doing stuff like this and getting to use that in the film and kind of we grow as the characters grow. And, and so it's been a real joy to just get to come back all these Lovely folks again, and, and all of the new ones that I just am absolutely in love with. So, yeah. 
She just has to dial up her moxie, I guess. I have to dial down the moxie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is true. <laughs> I believe I have a question here. Uh, hi, folks. Ed Simkus, <laughs> Gatehouse Media in Boston. Uh, I'm a DC Comics fan from the 1950s, and when I first heard the title of this movie, I said, come on, Superman could beat the tar out of Batman. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. Now, Henry and Ben, could you give me your immediate reactions when you first heard the title of this? Did you think it was ridiculous? And how did you come around to accepting it? And also for Zach, was this movie ever going to be called Superman v. Batman? Who wants to start? You want me to go first? Sure. It's funny because, like, I, honestly, Batman v. Superman, for me, from a philosophical I, you know, and it's the only way I can think about things um, because I'm so philosophical, obviously. <laughs> um, is that, you know, we wanted, I wanted to put the man, like the human in the God-human relationship first. Um, and, you know, for me, these guys, I don't know if they heard the title before they heard the concept. So, um, or I hope they did. It'd be cool if they just sent them a letter, just said that. On it, like, <laughs> you open it just at Batman vs Superman. You're like, okay, what is it? A prank? No, but it it. Uh, I have had a lot of questions. You know, it's fun. One of my favorite questions is when someone just says, "Batman vs Superman." How is this possible? <laughs> right? Like this is, and I'm like, well, we made a two hour and plus movie that sort of explains. <laughs> <laughs> Batman vs Superman. Though, and by the way, I think that you're right. The the notion uh, is crazy, but at the same time, it is a well, you, you know, it's a well, the road is well established that leads to uh, Batman versus Superman. And, and, and they're, they're, um, them being pitted against each other in the comic books is not a, it's not a thing we made up. You know, it's, it's a, con it's a, it's a, it's a trope. Well, the Dark Knight Returns was something that was obviously, you know, had that set that precedent before the Frank Miller book. So, you know, having seen that, I was already tuned into what it could be and hoping that that was the sort of angle that that Zach was taking. And uh, he had the uh, the little sculpture up from that in his office, and I thought, like, you know, this guy's definitely on the right track. <laughs> I didn't think it was crazy because I, I had read when I was a kid The Dark Knight Returns where Frank Miller, you know, did this comic where Superman fought, in fact, fought Batman and it was really original and interesting and turned the genre on its head and it was a morally gray sort of st story and uh, changed the way I saw comic books. So I had been familiar with that idea, you know, for a long time and when I heard that this was the idea of this movie, I thought that's brilliant because it's one of the great ideas in comics that hasn't been mined yet for, for films. I, I agree with Ben on that one. I, I knew the comic book, especially the Frank Miller one, and also the relationship in the comic books between Batman and Superman. And the idea was nothing but exciting because we're opening up the cinematic universe for the all, all of DC. I believe we have a question in the front row. Uh, Steve from Collider. Uh, There's a question actually for everyone. I'm curious if you guys have a day or two or a sequence from the film that you'll always remember, you know, the, when you think back on the making of the film. I think I shared mine as far as the reveal of Batman and Ben in the role and how fabulous he is. So oh. Oh. that's, that's the nice. new information. <clears throat> I was a little, it was a very unnerving day. It's true, the first day wearing the suit and being on camera, you think, well, here it is. I'm really doing this. <laughs> and uh, it was very nice to have Diane there, a friendly face and a great actress. And she kind of looked at me like, you know, yeah, it's going to be okay. <laughs> and uh, it was, so that was, I appreciated that, Diane, if I haven't told you before. <laughs> For me, um, it was, it's tough to say while shooting because I was in a green room at the time, but certainly I feel like I felt it after having watched the movie, but the third act for me in particular uh, resonated. And it was probably while watching the movie where I felt the most and got to step outside of the, the actor and was part of the audience. I'm gonna go with the bathtub scene. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, yeah, I'm, just too, kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Trying to lighten. It up. Just trying to lighten it up. Um, no, that was actually horrible. Just trying to protect my modesty and unflattering garments while like the demigod stood above me with his shirt off. I was like, 
low self-esteem for two weeks after that. But um, <laughs> <laughs> so you look true. fine. Anyway. It's true. I really was like, I'm, I'm hideous. Um, Please. Anyway, <laughs> she's not. Uh, <laughs> and wasn't. It was actually a, there's a lot of there's a lot of great. I had so much fun on this film, and I love working with Henry so much, and. Um, really getting to come back to that relationship in a richer way was really awesome. But there's a moment in the third act with Diane, actually, that became one of my favorite moments. Uh, just a quiet moment between uh, two women. Uh, just like as an actress, I, I like quiet moments. Over here, Sandra Varner syndicated. This, right back here, this movie, with Batman and Superman have dual roles, regular people, superheroes. And it's a, it's a debate between power versus will. Do you think that your characters are more willful than powerful? And when you have to lose yourself into these huge characters, what helps you get there faster? Your little boy hero complex or your adult male hero complex? <laughs> <laughs> you need a sofa for that one. I, I have too many complexes <laughs> to sort through. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just pick any of them will do, really. I ran, um, you know, it, it's definitely, um, I think you're onto something when you talk about like w the will versus strength. The Batman, I think one of the reasons why this character has resonated since, you know, uh, the FDR administration with audiences, regardless of the way the country's changed and pop culture has changed, is because you have a guy who on the one hand is powerful and exciting and, and can do things that we all wish we could do, but he's also still a human being, you know, and struggling with his own uh, vulnerabilities and fragilities and, and, and his struggling with his own will. And he is a kind of for accomplishes things by force of will, I think, Batman. And um, that, was, uh, that was fun and exciting to, uh, to play. And yeah, it's definitely, but I, and I think I tapped into equal measure my um, you know, adult geekness and, and kid excitement for this movie. There was, there's, as you can just see from this, like, I mean, uh, in this room, there's so much Every day there was something new to kind of geek out about and be excited by and be like, I can't believe I'm, I get to be in this movie. You know, it's, uh, it was exciting every day. Time for a couple more questions. We'll okay. Uh, ben, uh, Stephen Shaver here, Boston Herald. When you were growing up as a boy in Boston, did you think about Batman very much? And you gave a great uh, interview with the New York Times and talked about the uh, duality of the character and can you talk about how you see him in this in this movie and Henry similarly Superman seems to go through a big change here if you could talk about that there's a store on Monaber Street called Millionaire Picnic which is still open I think which is where I bought the Frank Miller book when I was I don't know what I wasn't minus five I was I, I had a plus <laughs> of my actually, age I did the calculation uh, I was minus ten okay so, uh, <laughs> rub it in rub it thanks in. yeah <laughs> I was old enough it to be catches. wandering around the city by myself, apparently, so uh, that separates us. Um, the, uh, that store's still there. That's where I bought my first, th those first comics, and, and that, as I said, was the first comic that, I, that really took my appreciation of this genre to another level. It was right when people were kind of doing those, innovating in that way, when Watchmen came out around the same time, and, um, you know, really kind of newer, more adult um, sophisticated, complicated ways of looking at this world started to be developed within the comic genre. It took the it took the movie business 20 years to catch up, to start making, to be willing to you know really mine these stories in this genre for complicated um, and and interesting and resonant, rich stories. Um, but but it, it has now, obviously. And um, um, yes, that's where it was. And I, uh, I can't remember what else. That's where I bought them. Oh, the duality of the part. Yeah, I mean, it, Bruce Wayne is like, Zach often said that he thought Bruce Wayne was kind of a mask or a character that he put on, you know, as much as, as Batman was. And he liked the idea that there was this ritual sort of, you know, just putting on the suit and getting ready. And the way he, the way he looked and the whole thing was like a, a way of putting on a mask to the world and presenting this alter ego Bruce Wayne person to the world. And I thought that was interesting. And I like the idea that both Bruce Wayne and Batman were really sort of unhealthy people, you know, who are engaging in unhealthy behavior at night um, <laughs> as a result of, like, you know, psychological scars they bore from childhood. Um, and and uh, I thought that was a, th th that, that duality was something that was really interesting to explore. For me, um, this felt very much like the development of Superman, of the character who we know and love in the comic books. We're still not there yet. Um, we are looking at the guy growing up. He's become this 
Superman um, after discovering he was Kal-El in the first movie. And now he's facing off against his second guy. And it's a tough outing for him because it's against a psychological enemy as opposed to a physical enemy like Zod was. And we see him make mistakes. And we see him grow through those mistakes and learn from them. We have time for one more question. It's going to come from the back. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Chris Richberg, EUR Web. Uh, Mr. Snyder, this is actually a two-part question. Uh, Mr. Snyder, Mrs. Snyder, uh, this movie deals with a lot of heavy themes. Uh, you definitely have consequences, the consequences of consequences, God versus man, and the overall theme of family. In light of this, in terms of balance, how much of a challenge was it to balance all of those elements in addition to the speak in, in, in addition to the action uh, that's automatic in the film? Um, yeah, it, it is a bit of it, it is a balance, but I think that you know when you when you sort of look at the tone of the movie, to me, uh, I, I've always been interested. Tone to me is the is the number one aspect of a film that I really am interested in. And this movie is, you know, it is at the same time a deconstruction as it is a construction. It's a, it is self-reflexive in some subtle ways in that, you know, when you have icons of this magnitude and comic book characters of this magnitude and sort of mythology of this magnitude, you have to, there, there's a little bit of letting off the hook. You know, we never, we take it heart attack serious, but at the same time, there's a self-awareness to the movie that I think you, you have to have in order for the movie to resonate on a second, on any kind of second level beyond just, oh, look, these two superheroes are fighting and, you know, that's cool. Um, I think that, I think that the movie, and Chris Terrio has written an amazingly intelligent script about what it means, what power is, what um, justice is, you know, what our relationship to these mythic characters are. Is it a relationship between God and man? All these questions, you know. And I think that, um, you know, to me that that's the balance, you know, more than the balance between action and drama. And, and that, that's natural to the story. You you know, you run into conflict, but to me, it, it really, this movie is fun because I, I got to have fun with these characters to tell maybe a slightly bigger story than just Batman versus Superman, though I am satisfied. My, the dork in me is completely satisfied by that. I do think that um, there's, there, the, the film is richer, and, and it's, it, it's, it, 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 it was fun to, to work um, on an idea that, that maybe is bigger even than, than just Batman versus Superman. And I think to put these characters in a real world, I think that they're easier to relate to. I, we can never imagine what it's like to have superpowers, you know? I, I, but if we see them going through struggles, if we see them kind of messing up and picking themselves up and... Uh, I think that's really relatable, and I think we like to, you know, see stories that mirror ourselves. Guys, thank you so much for letting us get our geek on. Let's hear it yeah. for Chuck Rogan, Diane Lane, very much. Lawrence Fishburne, Amy Adams, Henry Cavill, Zack Snyder, Ben Affleck, Dahl, the Goat, Jesse Eisenberg, Holly Hunter, and Deborah Snyder. Hey, it's Vale here. 2016 is going to be a huge year for action movies, and here are some you can't miss. Hardcore Henry, starring Charlotte Copley and Halle Bennett. Now strap in, because this movie is one hell of a ride. This groundbreaking action-packed thriller puts you, the audience, in the role of Henry, experiencing everything from a first-person perspective. You remember nothing, mainly because you have just been brought back from the dead by your wife. She tells you that your name is Henry. Five minutes later, you are being shot at, your wife has been kidnapped, and you should probably go get her back. Hardcore Henry slams into theaters April 8th. 
Okay, now, this next one has been a long-awaited release. Global superstar Matt Damon returns to his most iconic role as Jason Bourne, as well as director Paul Greengrass in the fifth installment of the Bourne franchise. Not much is known about the plot, but it will have a focus on the fact that Bourne doesn't quite know everything that happened to him and will also look at modern-day societal issues. Jason Bourne is set for release on July 29. Lastly, I've got Bastille Day, starring Idris Elba and Game of Thrones' Richard Madden. The story centers on a rogue CIA agent, Elba, tasked with apprehending an American man, Madden, in Paris, who is linked to an attack on the metro system. While the agent is ordered to make the suspect disappear, he comes to realize the American is innocent, and he may be the only link to the actual culprit. No release date has been set for this one. Okay, so there you have it. Let me know in the comments below your thoughts on these movies and I will leave you with our action movie playlist so you can watch all the trailers.